freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. This is Nico Perino, and this is So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. There are a few brave people out there who have given up a lot to go where their curiosity takes them, to promote debate and discussion, and to be who they are and speak their minds. Fleming Rose, he's one such person. He's the former culture editor of the Danish newspaper Jyllands Posten, and in 2005, he commissioned and published what are now widely referred to as the Muhammad Cartoons. The cartoons were an effort by Fleming to start a dialogue about self-censorship surrounding Islam. And he did this by commissioning cartoon depictions of the faith's figurehead, Muhammad. The cartoons started a debate, surely. Unfortunately, what they also started were hundreds of protests around the world against the cartoons, many of them turning violent. There were, according to reports, 200 deaths associated with the protests and numerous attempted attacks on the offices of Zhilin's Posten. Because of threats on his life that came after the publication of the cartoons, Fleming is now accompanied by security when he appears in public. He's on Al-Qaeda's hit list. The threats against his life, unfortunately, are not empty ones. As many of our listeners surely know, last month was the two-year anniversary of the deadly attacks on the satirical news magazine Charlie Hebdo. The attacks, which occurred in Paris, resulted in the deaths of 12 people and injuries to several more. By all accounts, the magazine was targeted for the attacks because of its cartoons criticizing the Islamic faith, and in particular, its cartoons depicting Muhammad. Charlie Hebdo was one of the few publications that reprinted the Zhilin's posted Muhammad cartoons after they became a worldwide headline in 2006. Most publications, including most publications in America, decided to self-censor and not publish the cartoons out of fear of the possible consequences. In short, Fleming's question about self-censorship was answered, loudly, and the threat of the assassin's veto materialized. Our guest today is Fleming Rose. Since the Muhammad cartoon controversy began nearly 12 years ago, Fleming has been one of the world's most vocal advocates for free and open expression. In 2014, he published The Tyranny of Silence, his book, which recounts the events surrounding the cartoon controversy and explores what it means to be a citizen in a democracy and how we can all coexist in a world that is increasingly multicultural, multireligious, and multiethnic. I highly recommend Fleming's book and put it up there with classics like Jonathan Rauch's Kindly Inquisitors as one of the best defenses of free and open debate. During our conversation with Fleming Rose today, we discussed the cartoons, of course, but we also delve into the distinction between self-censorship and politeness. We talk about Fleming's career as a Western journalist in the Soviet Union. And we also talk about what Fleming Rose is doing today, now that he's recently moved on from Zhilin's posting. So now I present Fleming Rose. Fleming Rose, thank you for coming on the show. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you. So I want to jump right in Mm -hmm. uh, and get this out of the way before we continue the conversation. There are motives ascribed to you, and then there are what your actual motives were for publishing the cartoons. Why did you publish the cartoons? The cartoons did not come out of the blue, uh, and it was not an intended... Uh, a wish to uh, mock the Muslim faith or uh, marginalize or demonize Muslims in any way. Um, <clears throat> the cartoons grew out of uh, a controversy around a children's book uh, covering the life of the Prophet Muhammad for children. And uh, according to the children's writer, he had trouble finding an illustrator for his book. Um, illustrators were afraid and the one who finally said yes insisted on anonymity 
which is a form of self-censorship. You do not want to appear under your own name because you are afraid of the consequences. And that, illust- and, that and, and this illustrator, in fact, recognized, admitted later that uh, his cause for an in- insisting on an anonymity was fear. Um, and, and was the and book supposed to be critical of the Prophet Muhammad no, or just tell w- his just life? Tell his life story based on Islamic sources, in fact. Uh, but 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 children's book books in Denmark, as in the United States, they have illustrations of the main character. Um, it's hard so, to get a child to read a book without one. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so there was a debate about self censorship in Denmark when it comes to dealing with Islam, and some people were saying, you know, there is no self censorship. Others were saying, yes, there is self censorship. And and back then, you know, looking back on the controversy, I, I would say that I I had two questions as an editor. Um, is self-censorship in fact going on when it comes to um, dealing with Islam and do we make a difference um, covering Islam compared to other ideologies or religions? And the second question was, if there is self-censorship, is that self-censorship based in reality, or is that self-censorship just a fiction of a fearful mind, not based in reality, that people made up uh, things about uh, Islam and uh, or, or, or some Muslims' reaction to criticism of, of the Prophet. And, and here we are 11 years later, and we can, we can now say for sure that the answer to both questions uh, is yes. There is self-censorship. Uh, and it is based in reality because people were killed. Uh, I myself, I live with bodyguards around the clock when I'm back home in Denmark. Yeah, and when you're here in the United States, I was at a conference with you last year at Wellesley yes. and saw you had two big, tall bodyguards with you. The response, and you talk about this in your book, The Tyranny of Silence, uh, to the cartoons, and this surprised me because this was never part of the narrative when I was reading about the controversy. The response was delayed, it seemed like. You published the cartoons, if I'm correct, in September, September 30th. Uh, and then the response from the Muslim world didn't come until the next year. Was was the response political? Were these used as, um, were these cartoons used as a tool to distract populations that would otherwise be critical of their governments to give them sort of a scapegoat to go after, and as you suggest in your book? Yes, I think that's uh, that's for sure. And uh, a Danish-born um, sociologist who lives in the United States and works at Brandeis, Jude Clausen, who wrote a book uh, called uh, "The Cartoons That Shook the World." And 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 she was not on my side in this controversy, but she she traveled around the world and trying to figure out what went on in the international context. And, and she, com- she arrives at the same conclusion. Um, uh, and, 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 and in that sense, the cartoon controversy is a very interesting case study in the way globalization works today when it comes to you know, information, uh, debates, uh, controversies. Um, <clears throat> in, um, in the fall of 2005, in November in 2005, there was an election in Egypt, and for the first time in for, for for the first time in a long time, the Muslim Brotherhood was allowed to participate in the election. And the Muslim Brotherhood is a fundamentalist um, Islamic organization, um, and uh, and and they insist on being the true representatives of uh, the Muslim faith. And for the Mubarak regime was more secular, it was very convenient to use the cartoons to show the voters, you know, we are really the true defenders of, uh, of Muslims. Yeah. Well, and the so, cartoons so, were published, I mean, they weren't published in, you know, that part of the world, right? It, I mean, uh, eight of the cartoons were published in an Egyptian newspaper in, no, in November. Oh, were they? Yeah, uh, but, uh, but, but it didn't cause uh, a lot of outrage uh, at the time. There's, uh, a, there's a portion in your book where you talk about a man who participated in the protests, yeah, because he heard about in, the in, cartoons in, in Iran, and he, he, yeah. I mean, I think you can say never have so many people reacted so violently 
to a thing that so few people, in fact, actually had seen. Yeah, and this man uh, saw the cartoons, and he's like, this doesn't look like a Persian. Exactly. Uh, like, like he, he looks like a Sikh. He doesn't look like an Arab, uh, the prophet. Uh, he didn't even pay no, uh, attention to uh, the bomb in the turban uh, that, that everybody, you know, pointed their fingers at as you know the cause for 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 this reaction yes that that was uh, that was a leader of the bashish um, youth organization um, close to the revolutionary guard in iran and he was in ch- in charge of organizing a demonstration against the danish embassy uh, end of january beginning of february 2006 uh, when they were throwing molotov cocktails and a reporter found him and uh, he visited his home. He had never seen the cartoons. He was just told, you had to organize a demonstration uh, because somebody offended the prophet. And when he, when he saw the cartoon, he said, why does he look like a Sikh? Uh, you know, with a turban like some Hindu or not like uh, uh, the prophet Muhammad. So, so and, and, and I think that says something. Uh, it indicates that, uh, I mean, you saw it in the Palestinian territories, you saw it in Pakistan. There were domestic political reasons for exploiting this. And if you look at the, at, at the higher political level, it was a real uh, gift to the organization of Islamic cooperation that had been irrelevant for many years. And, and for them, this was an opportunity to unite around the flag. Um, so, so, so they regain some visibility within the Muslim world, and and they are the ones who are pushing um, the issue of promoting uh, blasphemy laws, uh, a global blasphemy law within the the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. Mm-hmm. Well, for our listeners who aren't too familiar with the the controversy or with the Islamic faith, what about the cartoons was so problematic. It was the depictions of Muhammad, the bomb in the turban. On it, it depends on whom you ask. Uh, different people will come up with different answers. But it is true that within the Sunni faith, there is a taboo on depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. But the fact of the matter is that uh, there is no there is no basis for this in 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 the canonical texts. It doesn't say anywhere in the Quran that you are not allowed to depict the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so this is but, more of but, a cultural but, norm within certain. That, had, that, that of the I mean, you, you, if you in in Denmark, we have a, a, a exhibition of uh, miniature pinned paintings from the 14th century, and and there are depictions of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so so there is a long tradition within Islam for depicting uh, the Prophet. Um, it's true that there is a phrase somewhere, I think it's, it is in the Quran or in one of the canonical texts, that, uh, that it is only in the power of God to c- create life. So if you make a depiction of an animal, of a human being, you are kind of interfering with uh, um, uh, God's authority. And, and, and therefore, in the West... If you walk into a church, you will see a lot of images of human beings, but you will never see that if you walk into a mosque. And 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 there are very few um, images of um, of of animals or human beings when you travel to the Muslim world. So 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 that is true. But 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 I think up until the Khartoum controversy. Um, uh, Islamic clerics uh, and 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 Muslims, they would they would they they used to insist on applying Islamic law in Islamic countries, meaning that if I go to Saudi Arabia, I will I will not insist on uh, publishing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad you or walk, you violate uh, uh, their rules. You'll take off the shoes when exactly, you go to the mosque. Yes, yes, yes all, all that. What is new in this case is that there are Muslims insisting on applying Islamic law in non- non-Islamic countries. And I think that has to do with, with, with this new global public sphere where it's very due to di- the digital technology and migration 
uh, that's a lot of Muslims in Western Europe. Uh, this there is a battle going on for where you draw uh, the limits and 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 whose rules are to prevail in this uh, new public uh, global space. Mm-hmm. Well, you talk in your book uh, about defending this ancient liberal tradition of no group getting special treatment. Yes. When we talk about public discourse, I mean, and free speech, it's it seems to me it's almost impossible to have the freedom of speech without the freedom to question the first question, which is, who was our creator? Of course. And to criticize and condemn those who you consider to have the wrong opinion on that. And we accept that within most Western societies, but my understanding is that it's not really accepted in, in all societies. And now you have this clash as a result of globalization that has uh, brought this issue to the forefront. Yes, and, 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 and there were times in the West in Europe when uh, it wasn't obvious that you had a right to uh, challenge religion. Uh, I mean, what you're talking about is in fact a product or a result of the Enlightenment. Um, and um, before the Enlightenment, I mean, we had decades of, of religious wars when, when Protestants were killing Catholics and, and, and when Catholics uh, criticized uh, Lutherans, uh, it was being perceived as a physical attack on, uh, on the church, on the belief, and therefore you, 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 you needed to kill people who, uh, who challenged uh, religion as heretics or blasphemers. It, it was really being perceived as uh, real violence, uh, but, but that, that stopped or starting to seed uh, fade away uh, after the Enlightenment. And, and in the West, we established this very important distinction between words and deeds, mm-hmm. which I think is fundamental to, um, to, to, to the possibility of defending free speech. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're obfuscating that in a lot of our debates about free speech right now, especially on campus where you have a number of students and administrators who are calling for censorship under the assumption or using the rhetoric of verbal violence, the idea that your speech cuts like a knife and because it cuts like a knife we need to do something about it yeah and i think these people they i don't think they're quite conscious uh, about you know what they're doing it is true that words can be painful and they can hurt and we should not uh, you know try to explain that away uh, it's it, it it may be very painful to be exposed to mockery and ridicule and criticism uh, the problem is that the alternative is far worse. <laughs> um, and if you look at liberal democracies and, or free societies and unfree societies, one of the fundamental distinctions between a free society and an unfree society is that in a free society we make a distinction between words and deeds, which they do not do in unfree societies. In, 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 in both free and unfree societies, it's a criminal offense T- tax evasion, shoplifting, fast driving, uh, driving under the influence. Uh, that, 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 that's a lot of, of, of uh, actions that are criminalized in an equal way in a free and unfree society. Where the distinction is uh, crucial is that unfree societies, they criminalize words as if they were deeds. And that's why dissidents... Um, uh, people of other faiths than the dominating one, uh, they end up in jail. They end up in labor camps. They're being exiled and they be even be killed. Uh, so, so uh, we should be very cautious when we uh, when we and and understand what in fact we are entering a territory that is being very. Um, fruitful to dictators when we when we start equalizing words and deeds. There is a crucial difference, even though we have to admit, yes, uh, words can be very painful and we should not explain that away. And, and of course, you don't want to hurt other people, you know, deliberately. But, but I believe that, that uh, if, if, if you welcome diversity 
And most of the people who who are making the point you uh, you explain, they usually say, you know, diversity is wonderful. Uh, we have to celebrate uh, cultural, ethnic, and uh, religious diversity. But at the same time, they don't want any diversity when it comes to speech. They 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 say, you know, the more diversity we have in terms of culture, ethnicity, and religion, the less diversity we need to have when it comes to speech. And to me, that's illogical. If you if you welcome and celebrate diversity of religion, culture, and ethnicity, you have to accept that it goes with that territory that people, if they believe in different things, if they have different ethnic backgrounds, if they have different cultural affinities and they live their lives in different ways and they believe in different gods, they will express themselves in different ways. And you will have situations where one man's blasphemy will be another man's sacred uh, dogma. Mm-hmm. What is uh, and 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 what may sound like hate speech to me may like may sound like poetry to you, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 that is in fact uh, the condition of an increasingly uh, diverse society. And and my fear is that too many politicians they want to sacrifice freedom of speech on the altar of diversity, and I'm. I, I won't accept that, uh, 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 and I think it's wrong. And I think, in fact, the more diverse a society, the more freedom of expression you need. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people would argue that this isn't censorship, or when people don't speak their mind, it isn't self-censorship. They would say, and you address this in your book, that it's just politeness. What's yes. your response to that? You say in your book that you know there's an important distinction between self-censorship and good manners, and that you're a sworn devotee of good manners. So how do you see the difference in the distinction there? I see the distinction uh, the following way. Um, Good manners and etiquette. Uh, I mean, it's something that you do voluntarily. Uh, um, You decide that if I go into a restaurant, I will not eat with my fingers. If you want to eat with your fingers, you go to another place. And uh, when I try to be polite to you and you try to be polite to me, it's because that's the way we choose to to engage in a conversation. Um, That has nothing to do with with Uh, self-censorship. Self-censorship, the definition of self-censorship is, you know, I would like to say this, but I'm not doing it because I'm afraid of what might happen to me if I do it. So there is an element of an element of fear, intimidation, uh, and a, and a, a potential threat. And un- unfortunately, uh, uh, a lot of people um, confuse these two uh, uh, concepts. Uh, I mean, if you if you accept the concept that this is just about good manners, then any kind of self censorship would be acceptable. It's all about good manners. It's all about you know adjusting to... Uh, it's impolite to criticize your president because it hurts his feelings. Exactly, and we see that every day uh, yeah. right now. <laughs> With the new Trump administration, yeah. <laughs> I know you probably don't consider yourself a victim, um, although you might. We have victims of assault. We have victims of vandalism, theft. You know, there were attempts at assassin's vetoes on you and your speech. You, as you said, I want to have bodyguards. I saw two very large ones <laughs> last time I, I met you um, in Boston. What effect? Well, first of all, do you see yourself as a victim of an attempt on censorship or of censorship? And what effect did publishing the cartoons have on your life? Um, no, I don't see myself as a victim, though I understand that there may be other people who see, who, who see it that way. And it's... It's more, it's more, for me, it's more a way of approaching this situation and managing it. That if I, if I, if I start to see myself as a victim, it's very easy to feel pity for yourself and, uh, and, and exploit that narrative. Uh, for instance, when people are criticizing me, there are people who would say, oh, how can you criticize Fleming because he is living with death threats, he's on the death list of, of Al-Qaeda. And I think that's that's also a way of uh, caving into the assassin's veto, but, the, but just the other way around. I want to be treated as, uh, as, 
as uh, everybody else when it comes to engaging in debates and uh, am I right, am I wrong, do I have good arguments or do I have bad arguments. And you do that regularly yeah. when you go out yeah. and speak on these yeah, issues. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so so, so it's, it's, it's important to me um, not to uh, you know, present myself as a victim and also you know, according to my self-image uh, because it kind of also takes away responsibility. You can, you can blame things on, on other people. And I, I made, I mean, yes, I didn't ask for this fight. 11 years ago, but it happened so that I got involved in this and uh, then you have to make some decisions. Uh, do you want to withdraw and say, okay, uh, sorry? <laughs> uh, or do you believe that there are things uh, at stake that you uh, that you are willing to stand up for? Uh, and, and, and it turned out that uh, I care about free speech um, and this is fundamental to the way I understand myself. It's uh, fundamental to my individual uh, history and the things I experienced in life, uh, the books I read, the people I met, uh, uh, individuals that I admire. Um, so, so, so it's it's important to me. Um, uh, what what kind of consequences uh, did it have for my life? Um, for some of people. course, it is. It is. Uh, it is. I mean, I. Uh, I would prefer to live without bodyguards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's an invasion of your privacy, and you have to co coordinate your whole life with them. On the other hand, I will say, I am grateful to uh, my government uh, because they are willing to spend resources protecting my life. Uh, compared to a dissident in on an authoritarian regime where it is the government who are coming after critical voices, I am in a very privileged situation. The government uh, wants to protect me. Uh, and, and I have the freedom to say to my bodyguards anytime, please, I can't take it anymore. And then I will sign a paper and I will take the responsibility myself. So this is any time you're at home? Yes. They're there? Yeah, also when I travel uh, in Europe. At least, uh, so so no, they well they they are not you know they don't live in my apartment, but uh, but but uh, yes, every time I step out out of my house, uh, they are there and they deliver me when I uh, get home. Why why do you <coughs> why do you think it's important? And maybe you wouldn't use the word important, but why do you think your government thinks it's important to protect you? Do they think is it because as many of us who are free speech defenders believe that? your voice is critical to the well functioning to a well functioning democracy and that any time you can allow threats to silence i think i think there there will be different opinions on that issue there are people who would say that i'm that uh, you know i don't deserve the kind of protection that i i, I have or uh, but but i have become a symbolic target like Charlie Hebdo in uh, in France or uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali or and and other people um, and and the threat is credible uh, well, according to the intelligence. Theo Van Gogh, right? Yeah. Yes. So so um, but but uh, you know I I I I prefer to look at it the way that. I'm grateful for the protection, and in fact, the protection is there to give me the opportunity to live my life uh, uh, in every way I want. Mm -hmm. uh, the protection is there for me to speak out uh, and not and not be silenced. So, so instead of uh, uh, of of uh, feeling intimidated by the fact that you had to live with bodyguards, I want to see it as. Uh, I'm grateful for protecting me, so I can go on speaking the way I about the issues that I'm, I care about. And yeah, and you're not the only person that has to have protection for speaking on these issues. We, uh, you know, there's Kurt Vestergaard, yes, who's one of your cartoonists. Mm -hmm. um, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who you mentioned, she, ta uh, one of my friends, took a class with her at Harvard, and every single class that Ayan taught to her class had to be in a different place, because they couldn't let people know where she was going to be teaching, so they'd get an email the day before saying this is where the class is going to be. Um, and then you have people who 
you know, weren't so lucky with the bodyguard. I mean, Kurt Vestergaard had someone try and break into his home. He was in, he had a panic room. Um, the police uh, uh, reprimanded the man who took the axe to his door. Um, but people, as I mentioned, like Theo Van Gogh, who were killed um, and had an, what was there was like an impaling in, in his chest that said "Ions Next" because they had made a movie together. Um, you know, it's scary and. Um, it is, and and this is a fundamental new situation in Europe. Um, after the, the 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 killings of my friends and colleagues at Charlie Hebdo, I went to Paris to uh, to talk to some of them, and I also spoke to maybe the most famous uh, French cartoonist, uh, Plantu, who works for Le Monde, and I asked him, "Can you tell me when was the last time that a cartoonist was killed in Europe?" And he couldn't come up with a single example. Apart from a Palestinian who was killed in London in the 70s by Mossad or Arafat's uh, people. But but it was kind of Middle East thing. Uh, even Henri Daumier, the most famous French cartoonist who mocked the king in, uh, in, in the 19th century, uh, he was never, you know, assaulted physically. He he spent time in jail, but he came out and he continued, uh, yeah, and 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 cartooning. So so uh, I, I I really believe that we are in a new situation uh, in Denmark, for instance. Um, I mean, I'm not the only one. You also named Kurt Westergaard, but there are other people. Who has an issue with uh, Islam that uh, that that lives with uh, around the clock uh, security and 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 Jewish institutions? Um, I spoke at the synagogue in Copenhagen um, right before New Year, and 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 the whole street was blocked off, not only because of me but because I was going to speak at the synagogue that was uh, A double whammy. Yes, uh, uh, and and I. I really believe that that uh, that we have to ask ourselves uh, what does that say about uh, our society today? I mean, never, never have so many Danes lived with individual security as they do today. Uh, and it's funny, you know. Uh, every time I talk to journalists, when they then you know write an interview, they they always focus on my bodyguards because it's you know it's. Interesting, yeah. It's fascinating. It's it's dramatic. Well, but 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 they they never take the next step and ask themselves, what does that say about about our society? That uh, we do have uh, quite a few individuals who who has to live this way. And that's you know that's why I ask this question because it's a visual representation of what the worst forms of censorship necessitate. Almost, uh, so, and in the United States, we don't have much of that, uh, so it's n- novel for us. Um, you know, Ion Hersey Ali is here now, but um, yeah, it's 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 pretty astounding. And I was astounded when I first met you last year to see it. Uh, I I want to ask you another one of the controversial questions about this debate before I move on and yeah. to the next topic quickly. Um, the West's perceived failure to uphold its liberal values in response to the controversy. Namely, and I don't even want to focus on our government here. In the United States, I believe there was only one news publication that published the cartoons, if I'm correct. Was it the Philadelphia Inquirer? Yes, they published we're here in well, Philadelphia one, now. Yes, they published one or two. Mm-hmm. The Weekly Standard published all 12 cartoons. Okay. So there were a couple. Uh, a newspaper in Texas, I think. But But none of the big... I mean, Philadelphia Inquirer is a big newspaper, but... Not the Washington Post, not the New York Times, not the LA Times, not the Wall Street Journal, uh, not the Chicago Tribune. Uh, that's probably the five biggest newspapers, at least serious newspapers in in, uh, in the United States. And none of them uh, published the cartoons. And I I wrote an op-ed at the time in, in the Washington Post, um, and I talked to some of these editors, in fact. And, and they made the point, well, we... Are afraid, are afraid what might happen to the people we have abroad or to American soldiers. And I think that's a very fair argument. <clears throat> what, I, what, I, what I think is bad is that they were not honest about their motives. 
they were not saying, you know, we are refraining from publication because we are afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, they were saying, no, uh, one shouldn't uh, offend gratuitously um, and uh, you know we don't have to show the cartoons uh, we know what they look like now and people can go to the internet and so on and so forth and and uh, I mean in in uh, publication does not mean endorsement no uh, so it so means it's news exactly and it reads on the top of the New York Times all the all the news that fit to print and it's very difficult to make the case that the cartoons were not news January 31st, 2006. I mean, it was a global crisis. Uh, um, so, so uh, yes, that uh, that disappointed uh, me. Not not that they didn't publish, but they they were dishonest about their motives. Uh, and and this has been going on ever since. Because in the media, it doesn't sound very heroic that uh, no, we are not publishing this because we are afraid. They would ra they would rather like to rephrase it that. Uh, no, it's too offensive. Um, uh, we know what they look like. Uh, I mean, well, that's a, that's a quite because it's been e eleven years. That's that's an often used argument uh, by the Danish media, and every time it's being used, I I reply, well, we also know what Barack Obama looks like, but every time he gives a speech, we uh, publish a photograph of him. Uh, so, so it can't be about uh, you know whether we know what they look like or not. Well, Zilin's post on the 10th anniversary didn't republish the cartoons, right? Right, and, and I and I, I I left the newspaper uh, at the end of 2015, um, you know, as a consequence of five years of uh, disagreement and internal conflict that people didn't know about. I three months ago I published uh, a book in Denmark about this controversy. Which is a very sad story, uh, and people people didn't know that I, you know, I was not only exposed to an external pressure mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the death threats and and things like that. I was also living with an, an internal pressure because the top management uh, at the newspaper they wanted to silence me, and and uh, they accused me of being disloyal and. Uh, Creating problems and 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 so on and so forth. So so um, and and this is really a sad story about the way terrorism works, sociology of fear. Uh, that uh, you know these people. I had worked with them, some of them for twenty five years, and we shared values. Uh, but when but when the threat was growing, we started to understand our roles in different ways and. Um, and in the end, um, the former chairman of the board, he, uh, he tried to stop uh, a book that I published on the 10th anniversary. Uh, and then I decided, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't continue uh, uh, working here anymore. So, yeah. so I quit. Um, and now, in fact, I'm working for Cato Institute in, uh, in, in Washington as a senior fellow. Which published your book, your English language version of Tyranny of Silence, um, which I should mention, the, the cartoons aren't printed in there either. And is Cato honest about the yes, reason? Yes, John Samples, in fact, said uh, the publisher at Cato when uh, it, that question was asked at a book forum in November 2014 when I was interviewed by Jonathan Rausch who has also been on your show. Who has, uh, yes. And is a good uh, friend of Fires. Yeah. Um, and and uh, John Sample said, well, I mean, we had a discussion and, uh, and, and we didn't want to run the risk. So he was honest about their motives. It was Which is your threshold they, question. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He, I interviewed uh, an attorney here in the United States for this podcast named Martin Garbus, who for a long time was very involved in representing publishers, including, I believe it was Penguin Books, that put out Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses. And he talks about how his solution, and Salman doesn't, didn't like this, to uh, the threats that came with publishing the book was to get a publisher's consortium, essentially, to publish the book so the t threats couldn't be targeted at any single publisher or any single bookstore. Um, they would have they would be so diffuse and dispersed that you know it would be impossible to target them and there was a sense of solidarity amongst publishers that we will not be cowed in fact in fact, in fact in um, uh, fact a French publisher tried to organize a consortium for the translation of tyranny of silence into Fran into French mm -hmm. but he wasn't able to uh, 
to get support for that idea. So, so, so tyranny of silence, even though, I mean, France is one of the uh, key countries where, where, where we are facing these kind of controversies, uh, the book hasn't been translated. And, and it has to do with fear and self-censorship. Yeah, yeah. Call me idealistic, but I think you know businesses have business motives and incentives. But you'd hope that there were some people within these companies that were had values strong enough that they would say, "No, we are not going to be cowed. You know, this is news. This discussion is worth having, and we will figure out a way to have that discussion, regardless of um, the hurdles that we face." So. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got only about uh, 13 minutes left before you have to head and catch a train to New York. I want to turn next to something completely separate from the cartoon controversy. Uh, for most of your life, you reported on Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, for most of my prof- professional life, yes. I lived in in uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, I think, for 12 years, if you... I also spent a year there as a student in 1980-81 when I met my future wife. And then I came back in 1990 and worked there for six years. And then I went to Washington, D.C. and I returned to Moscow in 1999 and worked there until 2004. And you say, you said earlier in this interview, you know, you care about free speech because it's fundamental to your view um, about life and how life should be lived and what makes us human. Does some of that come from your time in the Soviet Union? Very much so. Uh, I th- I think that my where the commissar vanishes, for example. Yeah. Uh, if I if I hadn't spent time in the Soviet Union and if I hadn't been in touch with dissidents uh, who were forced out of the Soviet Union or were sti- living uh, in very different difficult circumstances inside the Soviet Union, I, I, I would not have reacted to um, to this uh, uh, assault on free speech the way I did. Mm-hmm. It, it really informed my reaction and I reflected of course up on it uh, later on because I figured out that I had a very different reaction compared to most of my compatriots. Um, and and I came to the conclusion that I, I had this experience uh, in the Soviet Union. I had seen what self-censorship, uh, censorship, intimidation, uh, threats uh, in the public uh, space can do to a society and do to individuals. Uh, so, so yes, um, uh, I mean, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's uh, fight with the KGB he wrote a literary mem- memoir called The Calf and the Oak, Nadezhda um, Mandelstam, uh, the uh, widow of a very famous Russian poet, Osip Mandelstam, who died in a labor camp in 1938. She traveled around the Soviet Union with his poems in a, in a, a suitcase. Uh, uh, you know, these books individual uh, fate and life stories uh, made a huge impression on me um, and and talking to dissidents myself and realizing that uh, you know these in- individuals um, they they were willing to uh, to go to to a labor camp for what they believed in uh, later on I realized you know they are human beings like everybody else and and they they also I mean they they commit mistakes uh, mm-hmm. They, they, they may have character problems and, and, and things like that. Uh, in the beginning, I was very idealistic and, and uh, you know, tended to see them more like, more, more like angels than human beings. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, I mean, these people, they are the heroes of, uh, of, of my life, I think. And, and it was really a life-informing experience to, um, to, to, uh, to be there and, and be in charge with them. Did you... Did your interest in Russia stem from those sorts of issues, or was this something that was developed as you got to confront it? You know, I grew up in uh, the Danish welfare state in uh, the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, and and uh, I, I never questioned, uh, I mean, freedom of speech. I, I took it for something, you know, given. As most do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, Denmark is a very safe place. It's nice. It's um, uh, 
uh, it's very liberal uh, and 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 then I went I mean I was I was interested in Russian culture and literature that was my main motive mm-hmm. um, uh, and then I went there and I just got a culture shock uh, because it it was very brutal um, I, I felt intimidated. Uh, people were afraid of talking to me as a foreigner from a capitalist, a capitalist country, NATO country. Did you uh, have your, you know, home or apartment bro- broken into, as you sometimes hear about? No, but I, you know, I met my wife and I moved into her um, uh, f- uh, apartment, and and uh, and uh, I mean, I was surveilled uh, when I when I when we decided to get married. Uh, to to get married, uh, she had to come to the institution where I was uh, studying, and there was a first department, which is a KGB. So she has had to you know show them her passport, and uh, they disappeared for two hours. Uh, I guess checking out everything, and uh, and and later on I found out that um, that uh, you know they, they listened to my. Uh, phone conversations and they even had put mics in private homes to to listen in on on uh, on conversations so so you really f- you really felt the eyes and the ears of uh, of the state uh, brother. everywhere yes yeah. uh, and 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 uh, so you, were, you you talked in kitchens or you you went into the woods uh, where nobody would uh, be able to listen in on you uh, so so it was a it was really a shocking experience and and um, uh, causing so much harm to uh, to individuals and social relations when you when you have to live with that kind of uh, fear and you're afraid of speaking your mind and can I trust this person that's huge distrust very low social trust even though you know they pretended to be a socialist uh, yeah, it was a socialist society. Maybe that's the way socialism works in 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 reality. So so uh, I mean, and it I, you know I I didn't draw quick con- conclusions. I was in a st- in a state of shock, and I was fascinated by you know this new world, and it really took me a long time to digest all the information and and arrive at the, at the conclusion that this is just awful. <laughs> uh, and then when I came back in uh, in eighty one with my wife. She, she couldn't come out immediately, but after a few months, I started to work at the Danish Refugee Council as a translator with refugees from the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I got in touch with dissidents in Europe uh, and also back in the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and, and there were organizations in the West who sent, they smuggled uh, um, uh, banned books back into the Soviet Union, and I did that myself. Uh, uh, li- uh, dissident magazines that were published in the West. Uh, I listened to Radio Liberty and Free Europe, uh, uh, BBC World Service in Russian that tri- that broadcasted into um, the Soviet Union, and all that stuff. Uh, and and that is really a f- it 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 uh, all this informed my outlook on a lot of things. The, the social distrust, uh, we have a big conversation about Russia here in the United States right now, as you know, um, as part of, as a way to sort of inform myself about uh, that conversation. I recently read, uh, and we were talking about this, Peter Pomerantsev's book, uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which it seems like anyone who is in the foreign service here in the United States or works within government is recommending that book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, I am familiar with it, yes. But this uh, I- uh, and, 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 and this is maybe, you know, this is a harbinger of this post-truth society. Does that stem uh, from the social distrust where folks in Russia just don't trust anything? Yeah, they're very cynical. Because mm-hmm. um, that's, the, that's the main point of his book, it seems. Yeah. But I would say, you know... The Russia that Pierre Pomerantsev describes is very diff- It's different from the Soviet Union um, <clears throat> because they are in in Russia today. They are not afraid, or they don't feel intimidated the same way by the West as they used to. They they believe that the West is in decline. When they criticize the West, they are not afraid of referencing 
you know, actual facts in the West, even though they also distort them um, and falsify them from time to time. But but uh, during the time of the Soviet Union, there, there really was an iron curtain, and they didn't want any smell of the West inside the country. Today, that's different. They 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 are, some of these people are quite smart. When they debunk uh, uh, the West, they are not afraid of you know bringing the Western narrative in and then take it apart. The With way their alternative the, 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 facts. The way they see it, yes. Yeah. Um, and and that's different. Although I think, I think the key lesson of the Cold War was that in the long run, lies and propaganda don't work. Uh, I mean, the Soviet Union spent a huge amount of money uh, promoting their uh, vision of uh, the world, and they had influence agents. Uh, they were supporting political parties. Uh, newspapers, uh, recruiting people for their cause, and so on and so forth. But in the end, it didn't work. Uh, and I think, I think <clears throat> one, of the, one of the reasons why we are so concerned about the Russians today is that we have lost faith in our own values and our, uh, the fundamentals of our own society. Mm -hmm. and, in, and instead of focusing so much on the Russians, I think we should pay more attention to ourselves, to what we are doing. Um, because we also, we have created um, a society where, where uh, you know, we, we insist, or some of us, some people insist that, there are, that you, you can't say that some values are better than others, right? Uh, multiculturalism. Uh, identity politics, postmodernism. Yes, yeah. and post truth, and you the truth. I mean, yeah, you cannot say that uh, that you are right and he is wrong because he has this background and he looks at uh, life in this way, and 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 therefore you cannot decide who is what is what is the truth and what is not the truth. And so, so this 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 uh, uh, relativization of uh, of of uh, of values and and fundamental concepts. Uh, free speech as well. Uh, uh, there is no such thing as free speech, as Stanley Fish uh, says, yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's a good thing. Uh, so, it's so, so, so we have been undermining uh, uh, fundamentals of, uh, of our own society and our values. And, um, uh, I, and I think that is, that is the main threat to the West today. It's coming from within, not from, uh, not from the Russians or from the Chinese. And, uh, from other parts of the world, and we are we are faced with it uh, in terms of the populist parties in Europe, uh, Muslim migration, how we manage that uh, according to our values, and being clear about what kind of society we want to be. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, that's where I come down. I, I, I mean, I, I realize that. The, the Russians are trying to pursue an illiberal agenda on the international scene, but I don't see Russia as a military threat to, uh, to, to the West. This is, this is a battle of ideas, uh, and we need to, to reconquer uh, the ideas that, um, that made our societies so attractive. Reconquer the values of the Enlightenment, the yeah. idea that when you say the emperor has no clothes, that <laughs> there's yeah. some value to that, and it's not this postmodern, post-truth. Well, the emperors are, might have clothes. Or. Yeah, and I think I mean, we already mentioned uh, uh, Jonathan Rausch, and uh, I recently reread *Kind Inquisitors*, uh, fantastic book, and and I, I believe that that is maybe the best defense of of Enlightenment values put in today's context and and, 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 it was and, and in the early 90s exactly and 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 you know the enlightenment values are, or, or what 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 John calls uh, uh, the liberal liberal science exactly is based on two principles and they 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 they, they apply to democracy or they are they serve as the foundation for democracy capitalism and science and these two principles are there is no final say. No one can say, you know, that this, the discussion stops here and this is the final truth. 
you always have a right to challenge, to criticize, to ask questions. And if you can challenge a hypothesis or uh, something out there and convince the public that uh, that 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 your thesis uh, works better, then that is the new uh, version of the truth. Uh, so, so that is the first principle, and the other principle is that there is no personal authority. You cannot say because I am a Muslim, or because I'm a Christian, or because I'm the Pope, because I'm the President of the United States, or I'm the Chairman of the Communist Party of China. I am right, uh, and and what I say is the truth because of who I am. No, it's all uh, a contest in the public domain among equals. No matter uh, who you are and where you come from, it's about the quality of your arguments. And these two principles have served the West um, uh, so good. Uh, but today, uh, there are too many people who don't believe in those two principles, and they are undermining them every day. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, those two principles were, in a way, also at stake uh, during the Khartoum crisis. Uh, that there were people who said, who, who said, you don't have a right to challenge because you're not a Muslim or uh, uh, because you represent a powerful uh, newspaper that uh, shouldn't have the right to publish mm -hmm. these kind of things. Yeah. Well, we have to end our conversation here because I know you have a train to catch. Uh, we didn't get to your discussion, to the discussion of your disinvitation from the University of, of Cape Town, which I wanted to discuss. Uh, disinvited from a conference on academic freedom. Not, not only a conference, I was, I was invited as uh, giving a very prestigious lecture on pre on academic freedom that they do annually. Uh, so I was not the only in disinvited for a conference. I was disinvited. F I was the only speaker to uh, to be at that event. Wow, wow! So they cancelled the whole the whole event mm -hmm. on academic freedom because some of the ideas that would be ex dis yeah wow. Well, uh, Fleming Rose, thank you for coming to Philadelphia. Are you in are the United States now, or are you still based overseas? I travel back and forth. Okay. Well, thanks for coming here to our offices in Philadelphia, and we hope to have you back sometime soon. Um, it's good to be here. <laughs> thanks. That was Fleming Rose. If you're interested in checking out his book, Tyranny of Silence, it's available on Amazon. And if you want to see the Muhammad cartoons for yourself, you can Google them. They are not hard to find and are available just about everywhere. I will end the show by saying this that people whose offense leads them to violence are enemies of free speech, plain and simple. I hope the free world chases these people to the ends of the earth in pursuit of justice. As we at FIRE wrote when the attacks on Charlie Hebdo occurred, expression cannot be considered free if it becomes too dangerous to engage in it. I hope for a day, and I hope for this day soon, when Fleming Rose will no longer need to be accompanied by bodyguards when he leaves his house. I hope for a day when exercising our free speech rights does not mean a bounty on our heads. Salman Rushdie, Theo Van Gogh, Ion Hersey Ali, the late staffers at Charlie Hebdo, Fleming Rose, these are some of today's most unfortunate victims of censorship. And I hope no others have to join their ranks. This podcast is hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org, or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. And until next time, I thank everyone for listening.